the art of overcoming too. And the title in the NIV, no joke, I couldn't have made this stuff up. <laughs> Further opposition to rebuilding. So, um, I don't know if you can resonate with that title of further opposition. You know, you, 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 you come up against something in your life, you, you make your way through it, you're in the clear, it's behind you, um, and before you know it, the next thing comes up. And um, there was a slight difference though. Nehemiah 4 was about, um, it was about persevering. How do, you, how do you keep going? How do you keep building when you're under attack? Um, and then Nehemiah 6 is, is, is sort of a different sl um, slant on it because it's, it's how do you stay on track um, when things start to derail you. And so, it, so they're kind of both useful. Um, John chapter 10, verse 10, um, is one of those scriptures that keeps coming up. Um, maybe it's become a life verse or a ministry verse for me, but, but I feel like if you were going to memorize the scripture and you were looking for like the backbone of what is this whole thing about following Jesus and connecting with God about? It's, it's this. Um, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Um, what God wants to do is give us abundant life. Um, but it also acknowledges that there is um, a thief out there who wants to steal, kill, and destroy that life. And so there's opposition all the time in our lives until Jesus takes us home and, and we fly away, as Dave sang it. That's the most morbidly happy song in my life. It is all about death, but it is all about life. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful song. Um, but there's going to be opposition until that day. And um, how do we have life and have it abundantly in the midst of all of that? As we were getting um, moving, our, our house is sort of tucked in the woods and there's um, all these things kind of growing, and um, I began to look at how the movers were going to get from here to there with our things, and there's like large groves of bamboo growing and bushes growing, and, and I'm going, they can't make it through there. Like, Christina and I are ducking down, we feel like we're going through tunnels. There's no way they can carry furniture through there. Um, and so I was cutting down bamboo, and one of them like, swatted over and hit me right in the face and so um, just resistance it's there um, and, it, and, it, and it feels like that when you're trying to get somewhere sometimes um, I think there's kind of there's basically three kinds of opposition that I think we encounter one is is that external like that that bamboo thing that is in our way that that person that thing that situation that is that is trying to just hold us back from what we could be in God um, I grew up uh, with, it's not fair to say it, an evil stepmom. She wasn't evil, actually. I was a very obstinate child who refused to let her um, parent me, and she insisted on trying to parent me because it was in her house. So that created a battleground. And we held each other back a long time from what life could have been. Um, and I think many of us have something like that in our life that we go, man, that holds me back. Um, there are just hard circumstances like Christina and I in the midst of moving, and we're trying to pack boxes, and, and our cat got sick, so we spent the day at the vet instead. And we're supposed to be celebrating this new adventure, but um, we're, we're saying goodbye to a friend. So um, circumstances come up that, that feel like they hold us back. And then um, the toughest one, this is the one that I really feel like we need the most help with, that's the internal um, opposition. There's that battle inside of us, um, and it's our baggage, it's our hang-ups, it's our unhealthy habits, lots of ways to phrase it. Um, first John describes it as, uh, first John chapter two, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And it, it talks about this battle of our, of our nature to want things that are not of God. Um, and that creates a struggle. And for me, um, I mean, you, got, you all are pretty knowledge about me, but I know that for one, I'm a, I'm a thin-skinned people pleaser, and that doesn't always serve me well, but that's, that's something that keeps me back from God's best. Um, and then uh, when somebody, like, uh, got in a fight with our new neighbor already, I've only been there 24 hours. You know, <laughs> around West Fall too much, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, um, but when that happens, when, when, when that breaks down for me, my next action is to just get depressed and to withdraw and to isolate and um, and I, I just want to hide 
literally like 8.30 last night, I go, Christina, I'm done, going to bed, curl up under the blankets, don't engage life anymore. Um, and I find myself kind of shutting down and I go into this thing where I just survive. You know, I, I, I scrap my way through, but I just survive and I'm no longer functioning in God's best for me. Um, so others, our situations and ourselves, they, they might hold us back from what God has for us, but um, this chapter kicked my butt, to put it frankly, on what it looks like to actually pursue life in the midst of opposition. So we'll go through it. I'm not going to read it all at one time. I want to go through it um, pieces because um, it offers kind of three, three really good principles, I think. Um, Dave and I had coffee this week, and, and Dave was telling me about how he was involved in Bible study fellowship, and one of the things they really encourage is principles that you can apply to your life, and, and um, as I read this, it just kind of filtered its way that way, so um, the first one comes from the first four verses of the scripture, um, Nehemiah 6, so let me read it for you. When word came to Samballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sinbalad and Geshem sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project, and I can't go down right now. Why should the work stop while I leave it to go down to you? Four times they sent me that message. Each time, I sent them the same answer. Um, one of the greatest things that holds us back um, from doing and experiencing what God can do with our lives is simply distraction. An invitation to go somewhere else and do something else. Um, this was folks scheming to harm him, but I love his answer because it gets at what it means to pursue life, and that is that is simply this. I'm busy. I, I, I have good things to be doing with my time and my energy and my life, and this is not one of them. Going and meeting with you guys on the plane of Ono is not one of the things for my life. Um, there's a principle in physics. Um, Aristotle actually said it originally, and it's um, nature abhors a vacuum. Have you heard that? Um, uh, we had to pull out a little plant near our driveway in order to get our car in, and um, I have no doubt that that plant will be back in short term because nature abhors a vacuum. Those plants are just going to grow and things are going to fill in that time. And our lives are that way. Our time and our space will get filled up. Um, we will be doing something, we will be thinking about something, and we will be engaged in something. Um, the question is, what do we fill our time with? Um, Jesus actually said that principle. Um, in Matthew 12, he tells a great parable, and, and I find myself getting brought back to it again and again. And um, Let me read it for you. Matthew 12, 43 and 44 says this. An impure spirit comes out of, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest, but it doesn't find it. And then it says, you know what? I'm going to return to that house that I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, put in order. And then it goes and it takes with it seven other spirits who are even more wicked than itself. And they go live in there. And the final condition of the person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Um, and what that parable says, says to me at least, is um, the best way to not get entangled with something isn't to go, I'm not going to get involved in that. I'm not going to get entangled. I'm not going to uh, get frustrated about that. I'm not going to screw up at work. I'm not going to not do this. The best thing to do is to go, no, I'm going to go this other way. I'm going to fill the house with good things. And then there's no room for this evil spirit to come back home with its friends. What are we going to fill our lives with? I'm not going to get frustrated with my neighbor as hard as that is because I've got good things to be about. I'd rather invest in you all, frankly. Um, <laughs> there are good things to be had. I think Paul understood this as well. Um, he wrote <coughs> Philippians 4, Brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, 
put that into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. If you want peace and goodness in your life, focus on good things. Um, it's so easy to get wrapped up in the frustrations and to get wrapped up in the complaints and to get wrapped up in all the horrible things that are going on in this world. Um, and then you never get around to the good that God has for us. Never get around to it because we're too caught up. Um, as my buffer went down and my energy level got down, um, I noticed myself pulling out my phone and reading Facebook more and more. And I started posting into uh, political frustrations that I have right now and all sorts of things that I wouldn't normally do. And all I did was get entangled and out of focus on the stuff that God has for me. Um, it's a really beautiful, simple thing to go, <coughs> I don't have time or space in my life for that. But I will make time and space in my life for this. And I think that's what Nehemiah is encouraging us to do. Um, I'm too busy trying to do a good job to focus on the fact that I don't like my manager right now. That would have served me really well at different times in my work. Um, I, I'm too busy serving people to worry about whether or not they like me right now. That would serve me really well right now. Um, I'm too busy living my life with God to be focused on these things that are getting in the way. That would serve my spiritual life very well. Um, stay focused on what's good, and the opposition won't get space in your life. Um, second part of this, verse 5 through 9. Then the fifth time, send ballot sent an aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which he had written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building this wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king, and you've even appointed prophets to make the proclamation there's a king in Judah. Now this report is going to get back to the king. So come, let us confer together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is actually happening. You're making stuff up in your head. <laughs> I love that. Um, they were just trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and that won't be completed. But I pray, now strengthen my hands. Um, there's actually a bit of comedy in here. Uh, if we remember from chapter 1, Nehemiah is the cupbearer for the emperor, for King Artaxerxes. And so you don't hire a guy that you don't trust very much to be the guy to taste the wine to make sure it's good and not poisoned. Um, this would be somebody that the king would trust implicitly. And so these guys are writing a letter going, oh, that, that Nehemiah, he's about to revolt against you and he's stirring up people and he's going to come against you. And Artaxerxes probably would have seen that letter and gone, what are they talking about? That's crazy. Um, but they're trying to scare him. Just making stuff up. Um, when we face opposition, um, there can be fear. Actually, nearly everything in life it feels like that's worth doing seems to have some level of fear involved in it. Otherwise, I'm not sure if we actually care about it very much. Um, I'm not scared when I don't care at all. But if I care about something, there's a fear. What if this doesn't work out? What if I fail? What if this gets in the way and they win instead? What if um, a couple weeks ago you all helped turn over this room into a bunch of chairs and tables for an event that Luther Memorial was having? It was um, a couple middle schoolers who are going to raise $1,000 for Luther Memorial's pastoral intern that's going to be coming for the next two years. These two middle schoolers decided they were going to raise $1,000. Here's what they were going to do it. Selling hot dogs, having a talent show, and selling homemade crafts. One of the kids was a prolific origami artist, I found out. Um, what if they had sat down and said, what if nobody comes? Or what if we make a fool of ourselves trying to do our talents? Um, one of the kids was going to do a judo kata thing. 
What if, what if they laugh at me? What if um, no one comes? What if nobody wants to buy my art? Huh? But they didn't do that. They just did it. Now, those are middle school kids. I admire them um, for what they did. My guess is, as adults, um, we still have a whole list of what ifs. What if I don't get the promotion? What if I choose this path and it doesn't work out? What if um, I take this risk and nobody comes? Um, and I have a, I have a um, theory about fear that's kind of progressed. I feel like we spent a lot of time on fear in this church um, like in the last couple of years. And um, Besides that, everything worth doing has some fear involved. Uh, the other one that's sort of evolving for me is that most of the expressions of, of hate and um, evil that we find in the world are rooted in some form of fear. There's a reason that terrorism is called terrorism. It's to terrorize. It's fear. Um, when we fear something, we don't usually act our best. Is that fair? Um, when I am working out of my fears, I make rash decisions, I make prompt replies that are not well thought out, I choose uncaring paths, um, and I don't do God's best in my life. When somehow I trust God and I love Him, the better seems to come forth. Um, so what does Nehemiah say about it? Well, he says, focus on the truth. You guys are making stuff up. That's not actually happening. So I'm not going to let it stop what's going on. And then he prays. Prays through. I'm just going to pray through this. I'm going I'm to face it. I'm going to declare the truth. And I'm going to pray. Um, I had a fear of heights. I probably still do. Um, that's fair. Yeah, I am. And uh, I, in, um, like right after high school, I started hanging out at the UW climbing wall. This was my way of dealing with that fear. I would, I would go hang out there, and I would sit there on the border, and I would just watch guys. And these guys are like little spiders climbing up the wall, and they are 30 feet high doing hanging from one hand things. And I'm like, that's amazing. And as I hung around these guys, um, they were willing to teach me a couple of things. I never went up there. That was scary up there. But they taught me how to at least get started. And um, so I started trying to climb that wall. And within like three or four feet, I would be freaking out. I'd be just hanging on for dear life. Um, but I'd look for the next one. And um, what I learned was that I would still be afraid. But you can still climb, even if you're a little bit afraid. And then um, one day, I, I fell off four feet up. Um, it wasn't so bad. There's like nice soft stuff on the ground there. And um, I realized, okay, falling is not the end of the world. I can do this. Um, later on, a year or two down the road, I had an opportunity to get to build a high ropes course for Sammamish Bible Camp. So I was up 30 feet in a tree looking at the view of Lake Sammamish. It was incredible. Still scared, but I learned that I don't need to stop just because I'm scared. Um, and then my friend John Shore, she's blind, and Mary and John, or Mary um, and Mark McCrary, invited me to celebrate John's birthday by going skydiving with them. That is not something somebody who's scared of heights should do. I don't need to do it again. Um, <laughs> but I'd never done it before, and so I could try because the fear doesn't have to own us. Um, it doesn't get to make the decision. God has given us an incredible gift. Um, two of them, actually. Today is Pentecost. These flowers up here were given to us by Luke Romer. Pentecost is the celebration of the Holy Spirit being given to us. There is God's own presence living inside of us that empowers us to live according to his will. It's a beautiful thing. It's like a little strengthening do what God wants. And um, 1 Corinthians 10.13 says this, No temptation has seized you except what is common to other people. And God is faithful. He's not going to let you get tempted beyond what you can bear. And then, and then this is the crucial line. But when you're tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. 
God is always there with us, providing a way. So we can stand up under what feels like will crush us. He's given us his spirit, and then he's given us his will. He's given us will. Um, the will is an incredible thing. God doesn't overpower us. He doesn't ever force us to make a decision either for him or against him. That's an amazing thing to me because God could so easily just overpower us. But instead, he entices us. He loves us. And then he says, will you choose me? Um, and the flip side of that is evil doesn't get to overpower us either. We have a choice. What will we do? So the principle from Nehemiah is this. Accept the fear as part of the process and then pray. Let God strengthen you right through it. Um, and so they prayed and God strengthened them and the wall got done. Um, last one. Uh, it's crucial, but it's short. I won't spend much time on it. Uh, verses um, 16 through 21 or through 19 um, or 15. So the wall was completed 25th of Elul in 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid. They lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of God. And also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. And for many in Judah were under oath to him, um, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah and son of Ara, and his son Jehonanan, whoa, we got crazy names, had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me this, his good deeds, and then telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Um, the wall got completed and they kept intimidating him. Isn't that crazy? Uh, the, the whole op opposition didn't stop. There were all these enemies. That was a list of a bunch of them. Uh, all these other nations around them. And they didn't stop doing what they were doing. Um, and God helped them to do it. There's a little prayer. I want to read it for you. Um, this is the prayer of Nehemiah that sort of finishes the opposition. He says, um, God, remember Tobiah and Sinbalat because of what they've done. Remember also the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who've been trying to intimidate him. Just remember them, God. But we're going to build the wall. Just remember them, God. We're going to do our thing. Um, they never tried to tackle the enemy. I don't know about you, but my first instinct when I come across an enemy is to deal with them. And then I'll get back to my work. Um, Christina and I, while packing, um, we found out we can't pack together very well. But... Um, <laughs> So I'm going to share with you a brief description of something that happened. Um, I'm sitting there looking at our overgrown yard going, the movers can't move us in. We have to get over to the new house. We have to cut down some of these trees in order for them to get there. And she's going, why are we driving over without the cars full? The whole point of this moving thing is to move our things from here to there. <laughs> what part of this do you not understand? <laughs> And so, we get tangled up in that for quite a while, trying to prove to each other the validity of our great point. <clears throat> Had we not been entangled with trying to convince each other of our point, we probably could have got the cars packed, got over there, and got it done all during that discussion. Um, there's a sense when we come against opposition that we get entangled by it rather than staying on track and leaving room for God to deal with the enemy. It's really hard to do. Um, but what you just heard about Christina and I was just a war of perspectives. And there's a lot of wars of perspectives going on right now, and they will suck every bit of life out of us if we let them. Um, we've forgotten what Nehemiah teaches, as well as the rest of Scripture. Um, Paul says it, um, 
Romans 12, let me read it. Don't repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. It's mine to avenge and mine to repay, says the Lord. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. Your enemy's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, what are you about? Overcome evil with good. Leave space for God to move. You don't have to tackle the enemy. And in fact, if you do, you will never get to the point of doing the good that you were called to do. Um, and I love how that chapter ends. But they kept sending intimidating notes. The opposition doesn't end, but the celebration does begin of this wall being done, the gates being hung. Uh, the good thing that God intended to have happen has come about with the help of God. Um, Harbor will not be defined by what it's against. Sure, there are things that we're against. Um, but it can't be defined by that because we're about something. We're about loving the Lord and loving people. And if that can be our focus instead of being against this, against that, against this other thing, because those against will actually stop us from doing the good that we were called to do. Um, there's this moment in ministry, um, there's a big learning lesson for me. I was working at uh, University Press in their college ministry, and there was another ministry that was growing by leaps and bounds, and um, they were endorsing a very, very, uh, what we thought, um, destructive view of women. Um, and we spent endless hours in staff meetings talking about how we could try to counteract what they were doing and how we could empower women and uh, what we were going to do to try to reach people that were um, confused by their message and stuff. And I remember this one day, um, Mike Gaffney, who was sort of a, a good mentor of mine, um, he goes, we got to stop talking about this. We're done. We're not going to bring up the name of that ministry anymore during staff meeting because we're forgetting to do for our students what we're supposed to be doing. We're so entangled with the enemy that we couldn't even get to doing what it was we're called to do. It's energy and time, and you only get so much of each. So what will you spend it on? What will I spend it on? That is the question. 